Hi, I'm Jeff, and welcome back to my shop. It's been a little while. I've been busy working on projects for here and there, and I've collected a bunch of different small snippets that I just didn't think were worthy of their own video. So let's chop them all up and squeeze them into this. The Variety Show, number eight. So, sometime last summer, I ended up scrapping a part in the mill. I was too confident holding it in a vise with a V-block. It was a piece of round bar. Now, when the going gets tough, the tough decide to sidetrack off of that project and build a whole new work-holding setup. This plate I specifically designed to hold a chuck from the infamous mini lathes. It's decent enough size for my little milling machine, and I was able to find the dimensions for the mounting flange on Little Machine Shop's website. I've been making it a priority to engrave all the projects that I make with my name on them and the date. Uh, just, I don't know. It just feels appropriate. Using a 3 8 roughing end mill, this is, to me, a fairly impressive chip load for this little machine, and this actually would have been before I even upgraded the spindle motor. After it came off of the machine, I ended up buffing the part by hand with a little bit of Scotch-Brite abrasive pads. On the back, this protrusion that aligned it up with the T-slot on the table, I ended up shortening it. It used to go edge to edge, but it actually interfered with the T-nuts on the table itself. This is a simple little work holding fixture, and it's come in handy for working on a number of round pieces that need to be held vertically in the milling machine. Obviously it could be made for any size and any manner of chuck, but these little mini lathe chucks are common, easy to come by, they're cheap, and they tend to cover the size range of the type of parts I usually am working on anyway. This very clean corner of the shop used to have a small, cheap, wire rack shelf that I used to hold all my work holding implements and fixtures for the milling machine. I got tired of them getting covered in chips and detritus, so I decided to make an enclosed cabinet that was made from spare material here in the shop. I don't really do woodwork outside of projects like this, and all I'm using is just some random 2x12 pine boards. I ended up with these somewhere along the way. This is not fine furniture making. I am using these scrap structural steel pieces as an edge guide for my router. I've got a way too big tool in my way too old router to route these slots. And after the slots are cut, I can make the shelves and then line them up and we can glue and screw them in place. Thank you. 
The majority of rough sanding I'm doing on this is with a flap wheel in my angle grinder, because why not? I'm drilling holes to mount the feet I made for my milling machine back in 2017. It has since gotten an upgrade to them, but I have these feet still on hand. The front door is held in place with a piece of piano hinge, which I installed in secret. I wanted this to have a smooth, rounded over aesthetic, so I once again utilized the angle grinder to create some large radii on the top and side edges. After this, I filled in all the gaps and the grain with some Bondo and primer. After that, I applied some oil-based white paint. Having lights inside turn on when the door opens turns the chore of tramming a vise into finding a midnight snack. I got these LED strips and they came with their own switch and power supply which I decided to modify to use with one of my extra limit switches. I just need three sets of these lights, a pair for each shelf, and I'm not great at soldering, but these strips are so easy to work with, it doesn't really matter. Whatever light strip I got came with its own switch and power supply. And changing out the switch was easy enough to do, I just had to reverse engineer it. I located the connections on its little circuit board, I unsoldered them, and then I just attached them to my limit switch in a normally closed position so that when the switch was opened, they would come on. After the switch was figured out, I needed a latch for the door. This push button latch is for cabinets inside of RVs and campers. I couldn't find anything else that fit the bill just right, at least not without getting lucky at a junk shop or a thrift store. This seems to work okay for now. The door needed a handle portion, and these cheesy cabinet pulls are just bad. So I instead decided to use the handle from this old kitchen knife. Now it's also bad, but we can cut it, weld it, grind it, and shape it to generally be something good. These all need a good cleaning before they're put away. So now I have this goofy little refrigerator-esque cabinet to keep chips and dust off my work holding fixtures. This is ugly. It's made from unrefined shop scraps. It was a proof of concept build. It works, but I mean, come on, look at it. That's gross. My Mills Hole Air Blast and Coolant setup is a project I did a couple of years ago. I made a video on it, and oh, dude, that's a bad shot. Let's uh, let's move the camera. But there's no reason that the manifold at the top of the mill needs to look so unrefined, especially after I upgraded the rest of the mill's head, and you can see those in some of the more recent videos I've put out.
After flipping the part, I apparently decided to drill the pilot for the NPT tap before facing, and I'm in my own comments section on this. That's bad practice. It's driving me nuts. Something I did on this project I hadn't done much of before was using my CNC mill in a more manual mode, using the jog functions to treat it like what it is, which is a machine with power feed and digital readouts. Okay, check this out. You can see the tool move when I peck. It's kind of crazy. Uh, there was some adjustments that needed to be done in the Z-axis Gibbs. I'd say overall that came out looking a lot cleaner. I got some adjustable flow push to connect fittings that I'm still deciding if I like, but they're a lot easier to manipulate than the needle valves I was using in the prototype. Last year I built a fourth axis for my milling machine, and right after I completed it, well, the free version of my cam software decided to switch simultaneous four axis toolpaths over to the paid version. <laughs> I was able to get it to do 2D contours as a simultaneous operation, though, and that's what I'm showing here on this steam engine nozzle. I'm essentially having to ramp down on the geometry at full width of cut, and in order to not break tools in this stainless steel, I had to go pretty slow and take it quite lightly. I did finally get the full Fusion 360 license last year after loafing off of the free version for years and years. It is nice to have access to the multi-axis toolpaths again, and other cam goodies they have. I had this design for a little bracket, it's a part that doesn't really need much in the way of precision, but I thought not only would it be fun to mill it, I'd like to try it all in one setup on the fourth axis. It's all simple three axis work, but in doing it this way I don't need to move it in and out of the vise and retouch off zero every single time. It'll just rotate and do the next operation. In both the full and the free Fusion licenses, you can do positional multi-axis work this way by selecting each toolpath's Z and X axes, and as long as your overall work coordinate system is in the center line of your stock, it will do the work to automatically rotate the part between toolpaths if needed. I did get a 5C collet chuck for my fourth axis. Seems fine enough. I had some of this acetal plastic, it was just the right size, and honestly my experience with it on the lathe probably made me a little too cocky in the mill. It machines wonderfully, but you can still push your limits too far. One, like, 
having a piece of stock that sticks out this far. I mean, I'm really asking for it here. Now, why did the footage all of a sudden come back to normal speed? Oh. Okay, so I don't know what I was thinking on that last setup. It was very foolish, and the cam for that operation had a bunch of silly quirks, like ramping down in the center, etc. So I worked on it and refined it a little bit, and luckily I had just barely enough meat left in the stock to try this part again. And this time it actually came out successful. Everything flexes, but especially thin plastic flexes. Now these holes I was just spotting so I could finish them in the drill press by hand later, so practically speaking it wasn't really an issue, but this is a large lesson learned. This isn't something I've tried before, but I wanted to do a fourth axis part off, and it's basically just a 2D contour on the one line that just keeps stepping down, and I'm attacking it from both sides here. I had no idea if this would cause any kind of vibration or cause the part to move and break off again, but uh, I just decided to send it anyway, and it was actually perfectly successful and pretty impressed. I left just ten thousandths of an inch as my tab, and it broke off pretty easily. I just cleaned it up with a deburr tool. This does require one last setup, and the part has a hole uh, in the bottom on the end. So I did that with my little screwless vise and some clamps on the mill table. After indicating the part in parallel, I went through the code and checked with a tool in place to see if I was going to crash anywhere, and I would have hit one of those clamps, so I'm glad I checked and I moved these clamps and then re-indicated the whole setup. Functionally speaking, this part came out beyond requirement for what I need it for. However, it was also a great exercise for a number of things, such as extensive positional work on the fourth axis, especially with working with a very long and thin geometry of this part, and even more importantly, how to work with this material, acetyl copolymer. I'm used to being able to really give acetyl the business when I'm cutting it on the lathe, but on the mill, especially in this setup, it needs a little bit more attention. A little bit more care, otherwise you can get some pretty gnarly surface finishes and some very clear and obvious chipping, a result of vibrating and inherent brittleness of the material. 
There was also clearly some sort of movement or misalignment from the first attempt that broke and that caused these really unsightly marks, these big grooves. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I have a few theories. Honestly, I was just going to call it done, but I couldn't leave well enough alone, and although I used up all my acetal on hand, I had some aluminum. I wanted to make this part in a conventional 3-axis setup just to compare. What I'm comparing exactly? Uh, maybe it was just the overall ease of programming. Maybe it was just the process of keeping all my programs organized. Maybe it was just the overall time spent finding my work coordinate zero. Or maybe I could just get a better looking part and a better surface finish. Uh, truthfully, I don't know. I know it's not a perfect apples to apples comparison, but that fourth axis job made me want to just have another go at it again, just to see if a conventional attempt would be any different. The weird onion skin on the very far side of the part from that facing procedure means I'm probably going to need to check for some backlash. I don't know. Lost motion? Maybe just bad programming? Who knows? There's that dang onion skin again. You and I both know that this right here is a bozo setup. I'm not even sure why I even tried it. I am taking this cut a little bit easier than the last one, too. I'm doing multiple depths and a little bit lighter of a step over. I'm just relying on the glue here for holding, so I have to go a little bit nervously. More onion skin on this part, on the bottom layer too, uh, which is a little confusing uh, to a degree, but it broke off pretty easily as paper thin.
so overall, I do think that the 3-axis version came out a little bit nicer. But the real question is, is it because I went at it with a better set of speeds and feeds? Was it because I sometimes had a little bit more rigid setup? Material difference? Or is it just because the second time you do something, or third I guess, it's always going to come out a little bit better because you've had that practice run? You know, I'm not entirely sure. It's obviously a combination of a number of things. But generally speaking, I do think that it all comes down to basic stuff like work holding, speeds and feeds, cam routines, getting those contours in to finish. I probably should have done some chamfering as well, just to be professional about it. At the end of the day, this is a bracket for a light for my backyard, so it does not matter. And with that, thank you all for joining me on this bucket of spare parts. It's been a busy year here in my shop, and there is no shortage of stuff to come. A big thank you goes out to my Patreon supporters whose names are right here on screen. If you want, you too can join them. I'll send you a sticker, you get to see the videos early, and of course, you get your name right here with these folks. Anyway, thanks for watching. Signature catchphrase. <laughs>